And now, Pushyami Gelgiredi and the Seven Daughters of Dingle, written by Sarah Kaplan and Timothy Vovro. One might wonder why a woman like Pushyami Gelgiredi would be in attending an auction for a cursed object in a city like Cologne, Germany. What need would she have for such items that could bring only pain? Yet there is one specific item that Pushyami was seeking at this very conference, the ram ship that had been stolen from the corporate offices she once worked at with her partner Gideon Goolsby, the very same ram ship which now housed Goolsby's very soul after Pushyami herself preserved it there, once Goolsby's soul had been trapped in the company's mainframe. As a young girl, Pushyami had once dreamt of studying abroad in some place like Cologne. She was fascinated by Gothic architecture, but she was also fascinated by history, and Cologne had plenty of it. Yet none of this mattered because all she wanted was to reclaim her mentor in her own position. It was easier than fact than Pushyami had even expected, for the ramship as an object of interest was paling in comparison to the other objects of the option, so she acquired it for a very low rate. It was that that Pushyami was once again in possession of the ramship, and her beloved mentor was with her once again. Once when they were alone in the hotel room, Pushyami held the ramship close to her horse. Gideon, Gideon, tis I, Pushyami, your devoted co-worker and faithful friend, who travelled all the way to Cologne to retrieve you. Gideon, my dearest Goolsby, please do confide in me how you are presently feeling after such an unexpected journey. To with Goolsby replied, most curiously, a single word in an almost rehearsed, nearly robot-like tone, most curious word in response, Dingle. Dingle? Pushyami had not heard a word before. But she was fascinated beyond belief. What oh, mayhaps is the meaning of this word dingle? So we still be replied, much like an AI assistant would, as he absorbed all the information consorbed into the database when his soul was vacuumed into the mainframe. Dingle is a town in County Kerry, Ireland, the only town on the Dingle Peninsula. It sits on the Atlantic coast, up 50 kilometres southwest of Trelly and 71 kilometres northwest of Killarney. The Dingle Peninsula is northernmost of the major peninsulas in County Kerry. It ends beyond the town of Dingle in Dornmore Head, the westernmost point of Ireland, and arguably the Europe. Ireland? Pushyami wondered what on earth could be of interest there. She had no connections with Ireland or the UK in general. As a student, she had studied geographical locations, and yet Goosby had mentioned some place rather obscure, and now she wanted to know more. Oh, I do, dear Gideon, did you mention Dingle? As Pushyami of her mentor, who is now curiously silent. Dear Gideon, Pushyami asked once again, what is significant about Dingle? Finally, Goosby replied, Bogum stones are stones of which short marks are made and groups between one and five notches, strokes or diagonal lines, usually on the edge of the stone. Each group signifies a sound in Old Irish, and they are the oldest surviving written form of the language which is still spoken in this area. Bogum stones! Now Gooseby had her attention. But she immediately went to researching these stones and was surprised to find the Dingle of the Dingle Peninsula was home to 60 of these stones. They were linked to Ireland's past, and Pushyami knew that Goosby messengers were no coincidence. She was meant to go to Dingle and discover the importance of the Ogham stones contained, and why she was the one that was asked to discover it. My dear Gideon Goosby, Pushyami once again asked of her mentor, do you know someone personally in this most unusual town of Dingle who might point me in the right direction once I arrive in the magical land of County Kerry? Her response surprised her. Dick Mary Church is located at 46 Green Street in Dingle, County Kerry, Ireland. My most unexpected dear friend, Gideon Goosby, Pushyami smiled. You, the pure heart companion to the Irish priests and nuns. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost responded Gideon Goolsby from inside his Goolsby got a ram chip. Patience, prudence, and constance. A riddle! Pushyami smiled again. Goody, I know riddles. Tell me more. On trier de fear, the three sisters in Irish are a group of three peaks at the northwestern end of Dingle Peninsula in County Kerry, Ireland, replied Goolsby. In an obscure site, she discovered the key. Was an article written by one sister Blythe Patience, a retired head nun who was still living in Dingle, Ireland. The article was about Dingle's cultural history, 
and the preservation of one cultural treasure, our ghost towns. Oh, I see, smiled Pushyavi. There you are, nines, then. Her father had always spoiled her with good riddles, and she was proud to have solved this one. She would set her sights on travelling to Dingle, Ireland, and purchase a plane ticket that very same day. That night, Pushyavi slept to sleep in the dust, believed she had accomplished her goal. Sitting on the nightstand, Goolsby beamed at her with pride. He taught his protege well, and soon they would find all the answers they sought and the seaside home of Dingo Ireland. The plane ride from Cologne Bonn Airport took a load all over six hours, and a two hour and thirty something bus ride, County Kerry. Pushyami was exhausted when she finally arrived at her hotel room. It was a little after seven PM. She was exhausted. She ate a small shepherd's pie. Go right to sleep. At night she had a dream. Herself on a hillside, surrounded by seven stones, each of which had curious symbols. The symbols resembled circles and sets of threes, three spirals like a labyrinth of light that glowed as the sun peeked through a hole in the stone chambered wall. Also, too, in a dream she recalled a fair haired Irish beauty who was carrying small white stones in her blue apron. Pointing towards three hills in the distance, of which three peaks stood proudly, beckoning her towards the inevitable curiosity of an ancient past. Next morning, dawn bright and crisp, and Pushyami was ready to seek out old St. Mary's Church. She suspected she would locate the same three nuns, Constance, Patience, and Prudence. How curious! At the very same church, she trusted Gilsby with her very soul, and she knew he would not lead her astray. If not at St. Mary's, she knew she would find answers at this curious quest somewhere, somehow, in Dingle. It came no surprise that St. Mary's was only a short walk from where she was staying. A few blocks away, an old stone church was quaint and hugging. It was peaceful and quiet, even as it sat right across from a pub. The solitude was inviting, and Pushyami eagerly entered, entered the premises. Thankfully, the church doors were open for visitors. Pushyami quietly let herself inside. She wasn't Catholic in faith. She didn't really follow any specific religion. Yet whenever she entered a church, she was compelled to light a candle out of respect and honour for the presence and history. Pushyami did hold an admiration for Catholicism, and she was immediately hushed by the beauty of the scene unfolding before her. She lit a candle and said a quiet prayer for peace for all beings. She doused herself with holy water and made the sign of the cross. There was no one in the pews. She sat quietly for some time. Goldsby was also silent in reverence of their surroundings. The church had a wonderful smoking bird amber from the ever flickering candles. The light streaming in from the stained glass windows created a sense of magic and wonder. She enjoyed the silence in presence of her surroundings. A lonely surprise greeted her, out back with a beautiful garden, complete with labyrinth and tree at centre. Poor Shammy took a much needed rest on a lovely wooden bench and enjoyed the covering scent of colourful flowers and the lovely spread of daisies spread before her on the well tended lawn. It was the kind of place that made one go into deep communion. She was startled out of silence by Gooseby at her hip side, and she began to recite what sounded at first like a poem, but was actually a prayer. Come, spirit who is our light, shine through the among the shadows within, warm and transform our hearts. Come, spirit, who makes a home in us, draw us to the dwelling and the treasures of us, revel in the inner journey of love. Come, spirit, consuming fire of love, fill it with your enthusiasm for your vision. May your desire for truth be vibrant in us. Come, spirit of peace, deepen in the action of peacemakers, heal the divisions that ravage the earth. Come, spirit of wisdom and insight, draw us towards your goodness and light, direct our growth and guide our ways. Amen. Amen, Pushyam is replied, extremely moved. She was presently surprised and secretly very impressed by her mentor's contribution to such a profound, humbling, preciously priceless moment of solitude and self-reflection. What? My dear go ready, and my girls be, is this source of the inspiration for this precious prayer of heart So. Think who perish I is the source for this parish prayer, my dear Miss Gogoretti, came the reply. Is a prayer to say at home when the world seems cold and the heart grows lonesome for warmth and touch and comforting. Thank you, love. Push on me place the goose we got you back in place. She looked around wondering why she was the only individual to appreciate this place on such a bright and sunny day.
She knew that most of the town was probably exhausted after having just enjoyed the St. Patrick's festivities. She was sorry to have missed it, but for the world had a way and strange way of working things in your favour. She, had she acquired Dulby a few days before, Dingle might have been a completely different atmosphere to visit. Perhaps too lively and distracting for her to focus on her task at hand. So Pushyami was comforted to know that surely she was in Dingle at exactly the right time. Oh, this glory had made Pushyami hungry. It seemed there was one insight on such a beautiful day. Instead of waiting for a nun or a priest to return, she resigned herself to head back to the old smokehouse for lunch. While she was digging into her fish and chips and enjoying a lovely wine, was she having relaxed enough to overhear the surrounding conversation? Almost immediately, three voices piqued her interest. She paused amid mid chew after sprinkling malt vinegar to listen. Sister Blythe, a hush whisper intensified. If we cannot retrieve the seven daughters of Dingle before the spring equinox, what are we to? Push this to Cordelia Kane response. We are in a public space, and this is a matter of the most secrecy. Dear Sister Primrose, have you contacted our blessed Diana Dunwood, as I have asked of you? I have indeed, Sister Blythe. There is no word of law in a secure location, though the last thing she mentioned to anyone was a trip to Dublin and an investigation into the sacred stones. We must consult a book again for intuition, Sister Blythe. Yes, indeed we shall. My dear, indeed we shall, replied the old and unplain Blythe. But first we drink, we frolic in the field, and we make merry. But now is all we have, and all we have is each other, and the endless precious beauty of the world. But first a prayer for a feast of plenty, for the Lord has served us, and served us well. Sister Cordelia, please bless us with your prayer. And then, a moment of silence before the words were spoken. Bless us, O Lord. And these thy gifts, which we are about to receive, from thy bounty, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The prayer was one Pushyami had heard before, and yet even she had stopped eating in reverence of it. Yet it was the conversation before it, and the fact that nuns were speaking it, which really had garnered her interest. She was searching for three nuns. Could these be the very three? They did not have the same names, but it was not lost on Pushyami that each name began with the appropriate first letter. It seemed almost too sweet to be true. Sacred stones, those of his ankle, what could be the meaning of it all? She knew it could be no coincidence she had been dreaming of sacred stones the very night previous, the exact same night she arrived in Tingle. She took the name of the name, John and John Mudd, and whispered it to Goosby. She would research later. First, she had to figure out what to say to these three nuns, how would she present herself? She could say she was a student of theology, come to Dingle to research either Catholicism for a thesis. But Pushyami did not like the idea of lying to nuns. Then she remembered the Ogham stones. She could ask the nun for directions. Quietly, respectfully, Pushyami approached the three nuns who were sitting in an armchair by the little stove fireplace. The fireplace was not as lit as it was on a warm day, but the scene still looked cosy and inviting to Pushyami. Though they had an air of agelessness about them, and well maintained their youthful vigour mutually, Pushyami was drawn to the nun in the gunfighter suit, who seemed to hold the presence that the other two did not exude. Good evening, Pushyami greeted the two. My name is Pushyami Gogoretti. I sincerely apologise for the interruption. I do not mean to be rude in the shape or form, but I could not help overhearing this talk of sacred stones. Are you speaking of the Ugham stones? Sister Bride looked startled. Oh, yes, my dear. Um, Pushyami, replied Pushyami. Please call me Pushyami. Pushyami Gogoretti. All three nuns stood at once, startling Pushyami. Please to miss you, Miss Pushyami, dear. Welcome to Dingle, Miss Pushyami. Where are you hailing from, Mrs. Pushyami, dear? I travel from Cologne, Germany, replied Pushyami. I'm on a quest to learn the history of ancient Ireland. She did not divulge more, because this much more was true, and it was all that the nuns currently needed to know. My goodness, remarked Sister Blythe, that is quite a long journey. Come, sit with us at head by the fire, and rest thy weary bones. One of the other nuns stood immediately to give Pushyami her seat, and Pushyami almost refused out of awkwardness, but then she realised it was even more awkward refusing a gift from three nuns, so she obliged and took a seat, her meal forgotten. Now, Sister Blythe said, 
Now that poor Shami was situated and comfortable, what is it about these sacred organ sounds that you find most curious? What inspired them to explore them, my dear? Well, began Pushyami carefully, I'm curious to know where the closest organ sounds may be found, or if there are any experts on the subject to be found in this area who I might speak with directly. It would assist greatly in furthering my studies. The three nuns exchanged most curious glances, as if they had to carefully consider their options. Well, oh, my dear loud sister Blythe, there are all those stones all over the peninsula, so I must say that your nearest discovery would be the Sovo Alphabet Stone, which is located at the old Kilmikadar Church, which is a 12th century Christian church located right here in Dingo. There are also the Balagandagart 9, a circle of Ogham stones, which are only about a five minutes drive from where we are right now. You might also want to try the Dingo Celtic and Prehistorical, Prehistorical Museum for information and other ancient artifacts from those periods. Thank you so much, Sister Blythe, said Sister Blythe. Sister Blythe, friends, I am the matriarch of St. Mary's Church. Perhaps you have visited. Pushyami had tried hard not to laugh at the irony. She had just come from there. This is a beautiful church it is, she smiled, beaming not just from amusement and admiration, but also in part. She had found her answer. Her boy had called herself prudence, which could only mean the other two. Her constants and patience. These three would become her guides. Nice to meet you, Sister Brian. Pushyami smiled as she shook the other nun's hand. And nice to meet you. Sister Cordelia Constance said the second. Sister Primrose Patience said the third, bowing regally. Better to meet you, Miss Pushyami, dear. Pushyami was about to inquire more when she was suddenly interrupted by a loud and tinny voice from the other room. We present to you, Hanwin in the hoods, the hairpins. The lights went off expected, unexpectedly. Pushyami had realised had late had gone. She had been out for most of the day and was now around seven o'clock. The restaurant had collected an unexpected number of patrons from the local latest entertainment. And he started with keep an eye out for that railroad bus. Oh, that old railroad, oh, where the ducks did cross. Oh, that old railroad bunch. Keep an eye out for that railroad bunch. There's a little one, but they hide away. There's only regular size one, but there's right and gray. Model two and out to play. Head from one side to the other today, keep an eye out for that railroad bunch. There's another one there, and another kind of stunt. One side to the other, they're having their lunch. Keep an eye out for that railroad bunch. They're going around the way, and there's a railroad bunch. Yeah, it's time for the railroad bunch. You gotta wait for them to get by. Sometimes they honk and hook. Geese and duck. Sometimes they honk and hook. Geese and duck. Honk and hook. Geese and duck. Honk and hook. Geese and duck. Geese and duck. Yuck, yuck. Geese and duck. Yo. That railroad punch. And butternut squash. What to do about the butternut squash? What to do about the turnips? What to do about the butternut squash? Will the little squitters eat it? And I can't believe you've never heard of cowlitz. Is it cowlitz smooth version? A tiny little cowlitz creature with tiny little cowlitz features. They live in stagnant cowlitz domes made from little cowlitz bones. I can't believe you never heard of Cowlitz.com. It's Cowlitz Feisty. Cowlitz, he's a midnight Cowlitz man. He's got his midnight Cowlitz plans. And he's singing all night long to Sarah Constellation. Oh, cow, 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 Cowlitz, Cowlitz. Cowlitz, feisty, cowlitz, feisty, feisty all time. Na ma na ma na ma na. And the cowlitz have an ending. Na ma na ma na ma na. And the cowlitz never ending. It's the cowlitz outro. 
It's in the cowlets, as you know. I turn them into cowlet dolls, made from cowlet bones. A cheerful mandolin flute brought her into the other room, along with the three nuns, as they all watched and listened in unison. All the band members looked to be young men in their thirties, vocal musicians, and a singer with a focal point of the brunch, a fair-haired lad with insatiable good looks, who often took a moment to smile at the crowd, particularly the young ladies who were nearest to him. It was of no surprise he came over to her table after the concert to say hello. Hello <laughs> there, miss, he greeted her in an unusual accent, neither Irish nor British, but somewhere in between. I couldn't help but notice he was a newcomer. I'm always intrigued by a newcomer. I'm Henwin Hoogstein, creator of the Hoogstein Hairpins. May I ask your name, miss? What you thought was the show? Push Yammy Goga ready, replied Push Yammy. I'm a student. I do prefer traditional. Your flute player is extremely talented. She added, careful not to mention his singing, for he knew he was already aware of what a good singer he was. Oh, really? I still, you say? I still, what? And we took it upon himself to join her at the table. But she had noticed that nuns had gone, and she was relieved that she wouldn't want him subject to this particular conversation. Oh, many things, replied Pushyami Courtney. I'm studying ancient Celtic folklore and history. She was rather startled when Helen beamed at her response. She's outside. I say I'm a student of Celtic folklore history. I come from a long line of bars, you see, dating all the way back to the goddess truth of Ireland and pre Romanian England as well. On my mother's side, I come from a long line of musicians, writers, magicians, and thinkers. Yes, it is. I do push me out of revelation. You say you're a student of Celtic folklore, correct? She asked. She wasn't used to asking others for help, especially strangers and especially men she did not know. However, this was an unusual circumstance. She was willing to break her own boundaries to understand more about why she was here. Yes, indeed, I am, miss. And we handed her the menu. Came for a drink. Please order whatever you like. This one's on me. And we used to. And we you yep, we'll accept their own faithful good and show you all there is to see in Dingle. Was she be surprised even herself in accepting his offer? They spent a good hour or more as they ordered dessert and at least two points as a fire sale in the house. Thanks to Henry, who it turned out proved to be better company than Pushy we ever suspected. He was beginning to enjoy this unusual man who it seemed was just as intrigued by the mysteries of the past as she was. During it all, Pushyami noticed that Goosby remained silent, and as though he was too fascinated by the stories that were Henwood picked up along his own quest for knowledge. When the old smokehouse closed, they went to one of the local pubs so as to continue their conversation. Henwood spoke of his journeys, not only in Dingle, but overseas England and Wales, visiting the castles and moors of Scotland, meeting other birds like himself along the way. He was in the midst of confessing his childhood dream of someday visiting the Isle of Man, when a loud moan interrupted him. Oh, gave the most despairing cry. He found the eye addicted to be daughter. Startled, push Emmy's turn towards the source, an older man at the board, who was attempting to drown his sorrows in beer. Oh, come now, Oscar. Come now, me lad. His comrade, who might have always always been an irregular, put his despondent friend on the shoulder. Twas your fault, me lad. Twas no one's fault. But where could she be, Liam? Moaned the old man. Where could she be? What on earth do you suppose that's about? Push him, he wondered aloud. But to her surprise, Henry knew the answer. What tragic circumstances, really, lamented Henry. There is a local woman called Missy, a member of the historical society. That poor chap at the bar must be her law. Push Yammy was surprised by the depths of his compassion and sorrow for this man, he and his daughter, who he didn't even know. That is tragic indeed, Push Yammy commiserated, nodding sadly. I'm sorry to hear. Is she a friend? I met her but once, Henwin confessed, with faraway eyes, at Trinity College in Dublin. Home of the Great Trinity Library. Poor Miss Lower Lilla Grange Henwin seemed to have drifted off to half dream. She's the brilliant sort, like you and I, always seeking out the truth of knowledge and accidentally stumbling on an adventure. And just what truth are you seeking, Mr. Henwin Hoogstein? Push Yammy was not one to lament when she did not have all the facts straight. Oh, I'm simply trying to make friends with the man behind the curtain, you see. 
Henry was always one for riddles. That was a riddle. Because Sammy would have to ruminate over for some time to come. So, you take me to the nearest dog who sounds in the ball row. Because Sammy smiled at her new companion. Oh, certainly, miss, smiled good Henry. And where will we find these sacred stones? By her side, goose be automatically chimed in. Deal Megat Art Church is a medieval ecclesiastical site and national monument located in County Kerry, Ireland. A most bewildered Edwin swan around in a circle. What on earth was that? Bushami returned a sparkle eyed grin. Tease my mental in the pocket, the brilliant, insatiable Mr. Gideon Goolsby. Ah, oh, Edwin had a twinkle in his own eye. You got yourself a Sam. Tis news to push, Sammy. A Sam to her that always had been a Goosby Gutcher. Her original invention. Selective automatic memory device. Henwin tried to peek across his table. May I have a look, see? How do you know about my Goosby Gutcher? Goosby Gutcher, you say? Henwin laughed. I've never heard them call that. They are quite advanced. My first study days. He was a scientist of supernatural technology that he could quiet. You say he is your mentor. What on earth has happened to him? I haven't captured it as Sam. He did an old ram chip, for Sammy couldn't hide her sadness as she revealed the device which she cradled gently between two phones. He and I were at first co workers, but soon we became fast friends. He was my guide and my companion. In all honesty, we were partners, both corporate and spiritual, for we often encouraged as well as influenced one another. I learned a great deal from him, though not surprising. He had run the office for many years, even before I came along, and tragically, that old oak wood desk was the last place I saw him alive. Somehow his soul was trapped inside the company mainframe. I rescued his soul by downloading it into the ramship, and it's been in my possession ever since. Who is this me, said Henwin, as he sat back in astonishment. There's a story for sure, that is. But well, how on earth did you know how to reprieve his soul into the ranship? Curious, sir, and curious, sir, my new friend, Push Emmy replied, allowing a small smile. For that is an answer, even I do not know. The trip, the trip to Kilmick at our church was a ten minute drive from the old smokehouse. They took the sleigh head drive out of Dingle into the countryside. As they drove forth, they were entertained by Goosby's occasional tidbits about where they were headed, only increasing the building excitement between them. Kumit Kadar Monastery was founded in the 7th century and located at the Dingle Peninsula in County Kerry, spread out over 10 acres and include structures from the early Christian era in Ireland, as well as some pagan elements. It is said to be founded by St. Malkadair, son of the King of the Ulster, who died at the site at 636. As they left the centre of the town, they passed a dingle distillery. Once they hit farm country, they were greeted by a view of the winding mirror moon town, which snaked through the field of green until it reached Kill Fountain Farm. They passed another historical site, Cair Dorgan's Stone Fort, as they headed further out into the pastures. Oh, the Kilmagadar Church came into view on the right. It was a hauntingly beautiful, almost looming, ancient stone structure which called for Pushyami's curiosity and imagination for so strongly she feared it was like it, but it washed with a flame. The cemetery was filled with old stone graves, many of which were in the form of the cross. Parts of the roof, like three stone crafted finials upon each apex of the three stone wall gables, still remained, as did the statue of the Virgin Mary, which greeted them upon arrival. And he took a moment to admire the statue, while push him, he was drawn immediately to the impressive large, long, thin stone further down the path. She meant no disrespect to Emergent Mary, but she could not help but run towards the very first fighting of an actual ugly stone. It was situated by the old stone path directly across from the old stone cross. Pushyami admired the tiny old carved through the top of the stone, and equally she admired the carefully inscripted arches. She wondered aloud what they could mean. Both the stone and the cross had weathered a bit with age, but there was no mistaking the exceptional care that had gone into making them, nor their natural beauty. Pushyami laid her hand upon Alden Stone, so a chill rippled through her body, and she shivered. Strange, it's not windy out, and it's a warm day. That's when she heard it, a sound from somewhere not far away, carried on the wind, like a spirit's whispering secrets of those gone by, and Pushyami turned towards the church, and stood absolutely. I am perfectly still. No, 
and when greeted her cheerfully. What do you think of this magnificent hush? Which Yemi ordered, grabbing Henwin by the shoulders and turning him around. Listen! Bewildered but curious, Henwin stood still, arms erect, back as stiff as a board, facing the church. And then once again, there came that terrifically ghastly, horrible, pitiful sound of someone or something, some cry. It might have sounded like it would be coming from inside the church, or maybe it was coming from beneath the... She didn't even think where it was coming from. And when he was holding onto her shoulders, his eyes as wide as saucers. Is this, is this, is this, a ghost? He hissed, and he sounded terrified, no petrified. But Shemmy was laughing, because if she were to admit it, they were secretly petrified too. But more curious than scared, where his hand looked ready to bow for the car, and to make a run for it. Hush! But Shemmy stood her ground. Either come with me, or stay where you are. But I, I'm going to investigate. Are you, are you mad? Henwin sounded like a frightened boy, left outside in the rain, begging to be let in. It could be a... Uh, nonsense! Bushemi shook her head. Something told her, this isn't what he thought it was. Either come with me, or stay behind. Well, I think you're better off coming. She added slightly. And we didn't argue. He quickly made haste. After her, as Bushemi strode with determination towards the ancient earth, surrounded by ancient graves of people nobody living possibly knew. Well, she only stopped when she reached the threshold, going back and nearly knocking over Henwin in the process. Goodness me, cried Henwin in a forced whisper. What? Quiet. Well, she only jostled him around the corner. It's not a ghost you're sitting there with. You're a living human being. Serious. Henwin looked relieved, though strangely more concerned. I wonder what could be the matter. He started in to move forward, but push him, he stopped him. It's a woman, but Shemmy proclaimed that she lowered over him, and she should only be approached by another woman. Me? Understood, miss, nodded Henry, eager to reclaim his personal space. Understood. At first, push Shemmy had thought she was seeing the woman from her dream, the one with the blue apron carrying rocks. Well, this young, fair-haired woman was in fact wearing blue. It was a simple blue shirt and blue jeans, as if to accentuate her current emotion. She was sitting on a hard stone ground, knees drawn up to herself, as if for protection. They shielded by arms that she had wrapped around her head. She wept into her arms with such despair that it took all of Push Emmy's restraint not to run and wrap her in her arms. For a moment she held back, waiting for the right moment to approach this fair-haired stranger. Excuse me, miss. The woman leapt to her feet with such a fright that Push Emmy near fell backwards with surprise. Oh, that's the woman. She says, stay back. Oh, cry up, help. Please, don't be frightened. Push Shemmy held her hand out invitingly, though she kept at a safe distance. I'm not going to hurt you. I just want to help you. The woman didn't respond, only back further against the wall, as she could go no further without falling through the back window. I don't, I didn't know you. My name is Push Shemmy Gogoredi. Push Shemmy greeted, allowing a smile. I'm simply a visitor to this historic venue. I heard your cries. I came to investigate. Are you in need of hospital? No, not hurt, the woman sniffled. She looked down with shame. I'm frightened. For goodness, what of what? Push Yami looked around. There's nothing here but a harmless old church. Perhaps some church mice to keep you company. But pray hell, why are you here all alone? My name is Lorna, the woman smiled again. I live in Dingle, but I don't, I don't know how to get back there. Just came back from Dublin. I'm horribly, utterly lost. Lorna, Pushyami frowned. Her eyes grew wide. Lorna Lagrange, she inquired, her heart beat increasing with the very thought. Yes, Pushyami, and Lorna's eyes were fixed. But how? How did you know my name? An out of breath Henwin suddenly appeared out of nowhere, gasping as though he'd just run a marathon. Are you okay, Miss Pushyami, miss? I heard some commotion. Henwin, Pushyami whispered, this is Lorna. Lorna Lagrange, she was for, though still unable to take her eyes off Lorna's. Lorna Henwin lunged forward, ecstatic and ready to embrace the woman who was once lost, but now found. The woman in question screamed in terror and ducked out from behind his reach, started to run. Lorna, wait! Push Emmy ran after her, reaching to grab her by the shoulder before she got too far, holding her back. He's only my nincompoop of a nitwit friend, Henwin. He's a bit of a bull in a china shop, but please understand, he wouldn't hurt a fly. We know you because your name has been in the news. You've been reported missing. 
Lorna stood in place. Slowly, she turned towards him. Did you say I've been missing? The three sat just outside the church, each of them wondering where to begin. I knew I'd been away longer than I intended to. Lorna stared off into the distance as she spoke, her voice hushed with trepidation. If only I'd known how long. You say months. They've been searching for you since October, I think, miss. And we snuck a look her way. I believe they're about to presume you're... Well, I'm not dead, you see. I'm right here. Lorna sprung to that, suddenly pacing back and forth, almost maniacally between them. I was in Dublin for study, and then suddenly I couldn't remember why I was there. Or even my own name, I seemed to recall. Bump on the head. I blacked out, and then... Then I checked myself into the hospital for testing because... Because... Her eyes filled with tears. She smiled when Henwin rested a hand on her shoulder. Let us help you, Lorna. Henwin guided her away from the church. You can come back with us. Push him and stay at the old smokehouse in Ingle. I live in town as well. We won't be far. I think you should come with me first to see my friends, the nuns at St. Barry. Push him had forgotten about the mention of the missing seventh daughter of Dingle. The very same daughter that was standing before her now. Are you familiar, Lorna? Well, she had me questioned with the name Diana Jarmud. Diana Jarmud? Lorna hesitated deep in thought. I'm not sure. That name does sound familiar. I think you'll like the learns of St. Mary's, Pushemi smiled, as they guided Lorna the Grange towards the car by the roadside. Now something tells me. I think they're like you. Lorna the Grange, Sister Blythe was ecstatic. I like live and breathe. The older sister wrapped the younger Lorna in a cherished embrace. May your presence be the peace that overflows. Most loving to protect her St. Anthony, Sister Primrose exclaimed. What gift can I give you for an exchange for my heartfelt gratitude? They each held this stunned silence in Lorna's hands, which their surprisingly soft breath. All three of them continued to recite with loving eyes. With your continued help, I will show appreciation to you by being more faithful to God, more constantly prayer, and readier to do good by near as near as me. May those intentions convey my great thanks to the Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to Our Lady, Blessed Queen of Heaven and Earth. Amen. Tis the thanksgiving prayer to Saint Anthony, explained Sister Cordelia, and a teary-eyed Lorna, once they were done. A painted saint of all things missing in us, to which we have been calling to return thee. All three then embraced Laura, who sobbed with relief at the outpouring of love. God has granted us return of one of our most precious hearts, and we are forever grateful, declared Sister Blythe, with tears in her eyes. Watching this happy scene unfold from one of the pews in St. Mary's Church, Pushyami wiped away her own eyes that glistened with relief. And happiness. It will be in the paper, Henwin whispered, leaning conspiratorially with unsolicited excitement. I had to give a proper but disconcerting scowl. Oh, don't be daft, Push Emily rolled her eyes. Is that all you care about? She's back home safe and sound. And scowled right back at her like a petulant child. But we did find it, didn't we? Thankfully, the nuns gave her a reason to ignore him. They both stood and joined the party and presently approaching. I wish I could say I remember you all, Lorna, out loud, smiling through her tears, though she could not rely the sadness that had seeped her way through. But I'm afraid I've lost some memory and I, I don't. She looked as vulnerable as a wee child and pushing me again had to restrain herself from stealing the young woman away towards an intimate and protective hug. These two wonderful people, they... She turned towards Pushy Emmy and Henry, eyes shining gratefully at them. They saved me. I, I don't know what I would have done without you. It was in the end Lorna who stole Pushy Emmy towards her and threw her arms around her, surprising Pushy Emmy with a grip of her bird like hands. Thank you, whispered Lorna's warm breath into her ear. But how can I ever repay you? She asked them both. Perhaps we have a word in a. Began, no need, said Pushy Emmy. We must have our dear friend Diana, Sister Constance exclaimed. She will be so relieved that you come back to us all. Diana, 
Lorna frowned, her eyes grew bright with recognition as she turned to push him. That's the name you said, the church. My worried sister Blythe murmured. She really has forgotten, hasn't she? Not at all, replied Lorna. I do remember living here in Dingwen. Well, I know I have family here and friends, but I can't seem to recall their names or where my home is. She frowned, rubbing the back of her head a little, though she could still feel the location of the impact. What has caused this sudden loss of memory, my dear? Sister Blythe guided Lorna over to the pew and in front of Push Emmy and Henry, so they were close by. The doctors at the hospital in Dublin said, I'd like to have the bump on the head, but I don't remember it happening, or how it happens, or what happens, or after. after. Lorna began to fidget in her seat, suddenly looking like she might flee without warning, till Henwin placed his shoulder on her hand, and she smiled back to show her appreciation, which earned a smile from him in return. Her breathing slowed. She began to relax a little. And when said you were staying at the old smokehouse, Lorna turned towards Pushyami. Are you here on holiday? Pushyami is a student of ancient history, and when chimed first, she's here to study them royal. I'm a student of ancient history as well. Lorna, do you remember your first year at College Trinity? Lorna looked startled. How did you know I was a student at the college? I was a student there too, Henwin smiled. You might not remember me, but I remember you, Lorna. We took a class together on ancient history and legends. Strange, I don't remember you, I'm afraid. For a moment, Lorna looked sad. Then her eyes lit up. You're Henwin Hoogstein, aren't you? Henwin brightened. D.I.N. Henwin Hoogstein, secret founder of the Hoogstein Hairpins at your service. Lorna giggled. Hoogstein Hairpins, it's me band. And was being back at her proudly. In fact, we were just at the old smokehouse just last night. Four hours. Pushy him in here got to see it too. That's how we met. He like showed it, you push. Pushy him is just fine. Thank you, Henny. Pushy him is smirked. Henny. And when Blake was surprised, I'm no Henny. Pushy. He stood and stuck out his gender. Henry and Hoogstein, who counted carried true and true. Lorna giggled again. How is our seventh daughter of Dingle feeling? Sister Bly returned with a cup of warm oolong tea. Thank you, sister. Lorna accepted the cup gratefully. But what do you mean? Our seventh daughter of Dingle. Goodness gracious, that's right, sister Bly. Look crestfallen. You don't remember. Thankfully, your friend Diana will be helpful to jog your memory more than I can, my dear. The daughters of Dingle is an order of women with a very special lineage. Curious, Henry remarked. I've never heard of them. And you wouldn't? Sisters by his spoke in careful tone. Or is it a secret society of Dingle that only Dingle knows? She leaned toward both Henwin and Pushyami. This is why you must mention mention to anyone outside of this perfect circle. What do they do? Pushyami's interest was heightened now more than ever. Now, please, no, I'm telling you this, and as strict as of confidences, Sister Blythe lowered her voice, her voice momentarily grave. You not to repeat this to anyone. Understood, sister. Understood, said Henry. Agreed, sister. Push at me and comply. We are students of this land, merely seekers of the purest knowledge, the gifts of humanity that contacts us all. We will not tell us so. The daughters of Dingle are a group of young women, Dingle-born, who have been selected at birth for a special purpose. They are to protect the ancient knowledge of the sacred lineage that they are born from. Sacred knowledge, sister. Lorna looked amused. I'm from a sacred lineage. Yes, dear, sister Blythe smiled. Of a long line of ancient druid chieftains, priests and priestesses, who are themselves connected to the legendary race, the two of the dated known. But that is a myth, sister. Lorna looked bewildered. The two of us that they known were supernatural beings. They are immortal. How could I be part of such lineage? I am a mere mortal. I have no extrasensory capabilities such as they. The goal it drew was our direct descendants of this ancient race, explained Sister Blythe. They consisted of ancient magicians, artists, the greatest thinkers of their age. They are direct descendants, and you share their druids. You have been chosen at birth to protect... Your lineage through the ancient power of ceremony, magic, and prayer. Magic! Lorna and Hangwen both exclaimed at the same time. But sister, explained Bush Amy, surely you are not saying that these legends are real. 
I am indeed, said Sister Blythe, and when the sixth daughter Diana arrived, she can explain it more fully than can I. She is my sister, Lauren looked bewildered. Are we related? Only through lineage and sisterhood. Sister Blythe smiled warmly as she placed an arm around Lauren's shoulders. Thank goodness you came home to us, my dear sweet Lauren and the grain. For tomorrow is the old significant spring equinox, and your complete devotion is presence is needed for the ceremony. There's a ceremony, Pussy fifth, as she thought, in a dream. Yes, indeed, nodded Sister Blythe, a sacred ceremony, which is only to be formed on the full moon of the spring equinox by the seven daughters of Dingle in a very special and secret location that is only privy to the makers of magic. What will happen during the ceremony, Lorna, was equal amounts, fascinated as well as bewildered, for she had just learned her entire family history, and like a purpose, in a single moment, and hardly could process it all. Sister Bly smiled warmly again, and gave Lorna's shoulders another squeeze. That is for your eyes, and ears only, from the daughters of Dingle, my dear. As if on cue, another fair-haired, fair-skinned woman in a flowing patchwork gown appeared. She looked almost otherworldly, and for a moment pushed Emmy feared she was a spirit. But then, as if gliding on air, she strode past as fast as a blink of an eye down the road pews towards Lorna Lagrange and gathered her in her arms, pressing her against her bosom to Lorna Lagrange's surprise. And if she was being honest, delight. Dearest Lorna, oh, dearest Lorna, the young druidess proclaimed, hugging her tight. You have returned, rise be the Lord. She pulled away tears streaming and placed both hands on either side of the younger's face. A door was open for thee, she proclaimed. She placed a small Roman's egg, blue turquoise stone in one hand. For healing the soul of thy troubles, I give you the stone of turquoise for healing. She slipped another stone, a piece of brown smooth flint stone in the other. For protection, she said. Then she kissed Lorna sweetly on each cheek. Lorna watched stunned into silence as Diana placed a wooden amulet of carved symbol that had three dots and three lines drawn outward from its centre. Seemingly, a simple tiny acorn hung from the bottom of the wood. The omen explained Diana, a symbol of protection, of divine protection. The three lines represent the three lines of light for love, wisdom and truth. It is the true symbol for balance, my dear Lorna. Where it will, may all your days be blessed. Goodness, who oh, could definitely use me some of that? Lorna laughed uneasily. Should save for all in Dublin, and I cannot remember how to get myself home. Oh, well, that's easier, dear. You live with me. We share space with our cat, Owen. Come along, come along, we go together. Diana looked her arm around her, old friend, just like the old Scottish song we sang as kiddies. I must admit, I'm afraid I don't, said Dorla sadly, but almost immediately. Penguin began to sing. Come along, come along, let us food and act together. Come along, come along, be a fair for me weather. With a hill to hold me for us, and a purple of the heather. Let us sing in happy chorus, come along, come along. Soon Edwin and Diana were arm in arm as they continued to sing these same words, and soon enough, Pushyemi had taken Lorna's arm in her own, and they danced together all singing, Come along, come along, as three nuns had gathered to witness the joyous singing dance. For never had there been such a commotion in St. Mary's Church as they could recall, and afterwards they had seen crumpets, and then when fed them good night, we had promised to return. And then Diana took Lorna home, and Pushy Emmy retired to the old smokehouse, where she bid good night at Gillsby, and she dreamt of the most peaceful, heavy dreams of ancient songs and world dances. Whimsical looking women all standing together in a circle, holding hands together, singing and praising the love of the gods and goddesses of old. Pushy Emmy awoke with an odd feeling that she had been transformed into a swan, though she could not recall why this might be. When she examined herself in the mirror, she was still the same old Pushy Emmy. She gathered herself together and prepared to depart for town. Ah, uh, she had been invited by Diana and Lorna, and there was something of extreme importance to discuss. Greetings, my friend. Diana was wearing a bright green cloak over simple brown robes. She brought in Push Emmy for a warm hug and kissed her on either cheek. You have just come in time. 
I was just preparing for the dandelion root tea and baking us some hot cross buns. Sounds delicious, Pushami smiled and entered, surprised to find Henry already sitting in the living room with Lorna at his side. He looked positively giddy, and Lorna looked well rested. With her arm wrapped around his, they seemed entwined like a mistletoe in other branch. There's the lady of the house, smiled Henwin widely from his seat. We've been waiting. Well, if it isn't Mr. Henny Elstein, pushed him his smiles in response. And hello, Lorna. She bowed politely. Be you both on this fine, sightly, misty morn. Ah, oh, we've been rain never heard anybody. And we winked at Lorna, who giggled like a schoolgirl in response. Wouldn't you agree, Miss Pussy? Who's yammy, she requested him. Where has our friend Ash Diana gone off to? My word, this room smells wonderful. She found Diana in the kitchen, who handed her bush yammy a cup of dandelion root tea. Here you are, she said. Best medicine you might ever drink, with a dash of sugar for sweetness. Push yammy took a soup. It was almost burnt like chicory, but it was lovely, especially on a day that was recovering from a flash of overnight rain. Delicious, she agreed. Cans the blood informed Diana. It celebrates the season. Today is, in fact, the spring equinox, and a time of year where day and the night are of equal length. Spring is beginning anew. And I was told by the orders of St. Mary's that you were aware the sacred order is the sacred daughter of Dingle. I am indeed, replied Pushami. I think it's beautiful. I was so pleased to hear Diana handed her a sprig of lavender and rosemary, for you have the honour of being invited to our most carefully coveted secret and sacred ceremony of the spring, where we celebrate transformation and complete rebirth of all life, together call upon the goddess of prophecies and dreams. Pushyami was a deer caught in the headlights, so startled she did not notice the tintillating scent of herbs. But why have I been giving such an honour? Diana laughed warmly and heartily. You, my dear, have miraculously returned. Our lost seventh daughter of Dinkle, she exclaimed. You have performed a miracle, an absolute miracle. Not a miracle, pushed Amy Blush. Happenstance. Nonsense. Diana shook her hand with great conviction. You have provided the missing key. It is not something to be taken lightly. Not only did you return our dear Lorna to us, Diana smiled back to pride, but you have somehow managed to answer another one of our prayers. For each one of us has dreamt of a circle of eight, not seven. You see, we have never been able to pass the power of the star. And in order to complete the circle, in accordance to our prophecy, we will need an eight to join us. That, my dear, is you, if you accept our offer. How could I not? Was all that push every good thing to say. Oh, goodness, so it was really lonely in here. I went bushed into the room with an unexpected blunder. Only to pause with eyebrows arched in surprise. Hey now, what a miss! They gathered together and an undisclosed sight inside a grove of old oak trees, hidden from prying eyes. The trees were all in full bloom, as if to honor the day. Each leaf was as green as a shamrock, with the sun shining upon them, almost glowing like gold. The contrast of the daughter's white robes was almost hypnotizing as Push Yami joined them in their white and gold dress. Standing by the older Henwin, in an old-fashioned barge room, went to him by the daughter of Dingle, held a hanging vessel, which lent a scent of sage, where Lorna stood on the other side, the smoke from her vessel carrying notes of many ceremonial herbs of the season. The altar was a small table which contained various offerings upon a white table cloth, flowers, candles, incense, and herbs, four chalices, two nests made out of twigs and leaves, all containing three eggs each. Each member of the procession was saged and smudged, and drank from the chalice. Then they began performing the sphere of protection, invoking the elemental cross, then called upon the four elements, air, fire, water, earth, all while banishing the evils that lie therein, calling upon the three currents, thanking each current for its gifts bestowed. Then they began with a ceremony to call upon this year's particular goddess to be honored. Gary Burness, the goddess of dreams and of prophecy, and Pushyami noticed the wafting of sage from a white feather, realizing why she had dreamt herself a swan. The goddesses transformed themselves into creatures of all kinds, and she would learn later that Kairos Hosemarnum was the swan, 
which pushed Yami closed her eyes as she saw the graceful being gliding across the water as if dolphins and fairies slipped on by. The chime was rung, and a hush came over the crowd. The elder daughter Diana read aloud from an old cloth scroll. We have come to honor our Irish pantheon. May our awards, actions, and offerings help us through the connections to the Irish Shrews and Philidy, through our connections to the sea, land, and sky, through our connections to our own hearts, minds, and spirit, and through our work together on this day. A blessing on our time together here today, a blessing on our lives, and a blessing on the land. Push Yami closed her eyes and breathed in deep the scent of sage, as Diana continued. By the might of the waters and the light of the fire, this grove was made whole and holy. Then when all were saved, it were reclaimed for all for the guide to hear. We have centered ourselves, and we are now stepping away from mundane life. We have prepared ourselves to work with the three kindred. Our worries and cares are left behind as we engaged in our work here. Then they each offered oaks to the earth with a prayer to receive the blessing. Once again, Diana read it out. Great Mother Earth, Danu, we honor you. We gather here today to honor you and your children. We hear the songs of the birds and think of what you created. We hear the songs of the wind playing amongst the trees, branches, and enjoy your soothing voice. We smell the blossoming of the flowers and the cool earth beneath our feet, though we thank you for these gifts. We feel the warmth of the sun upon our skin, and we know in us as we experience the magic of your creation. We thank you for all you provide to us. Your blessing is appreciated. Fending together, they each held hands and spoke to the earth. Danu, except our offering. Standing together, Diana spoke. We stand here together to pay our respects to the Melanesians, the fair folks, the Athamain. And each one has heads bowed as one. Each member spoke. I am a part of all that is, and all that is is a part of me. I belong here in this world, and belong here as who I am. They performed the recreating the cosmos ritual. Where three portal gates were opened by three daughters, the first by offering of silver to the Holy Will, which served as a bridge and passageway between the living and the dead, the second by paying respects to the tree, joining past to the present, a bridge and a passage to the fairies and nature spirits as to benefit their ancient wisdom, and a third, the opening of the fire, so as to reconnect all present to Danu, Mother Earth, and a passageway to the gods, so they could impart their wisdom. They provided offerings to the spirit of integration and offerings to the three kindred, calling upon their legendary ancestors for strength and wisdom. Firstly, the druid who is not only horde, but judge, the legendary American white niece, and in return for his ancient and everlasting wisdom. Duke Elaine for his encouragement in faith, the legendary demigod to sustain during all kinds of adversary, and to the other the legendary giant the legendary giant Finn McCool, in return for ancient wisdom, as bestowed by the Salmon of Knowledge. They called upon the nature spirits and fair folk, those noble spirits of land, sea, and sky, and they called upon the nature gods and goddesses of nature spirits in all things, and they invited the grateful, precious presence of the wind. Gathering about the crackling fire that sent embers of light sparkling up into the sky, Diana spoke aloud. Shining ones from the realms above to the two are the day none, O dwell in the mount. Those who are from on high, or from under us, hear our requests. Those Irish kings of the two are the day to know, New order of the silver arm, the dagda, and Lou of the long arm. We call out to you, and we hope you hear our call, so we may interact with you and those you led. God and goddesses come join us. Shining ones, accept our offering. To which all daughters proclaimed aloud, push Yami now including. Shining ones, accept our offering. Then they called upon Care Obermuth, wearer of chains and silver of gold, keeper of poisonous new berries, the goddess of swans, and daughter of an ancient prince who transformed herself into a swan, and married the god Angus, a member of the ancient ruling race of Ireland, which was a day to none.
They call upon her for her insight and wisdom, praising her for the graces and humbly requesting her blessings. And suddenly a hush fell over the glen, and all the inhabitants were therein. The faint sound of her music began to play, and suddenly pushed at me, like a mighty rush of air against her face, as she heard a majestic flapping of wings, the tell-tale trumpeting call of the swan. A voice so sweet it seems to belong to the wind of the ancient forests was heard, speaking with a word of wisdom that the daughters had so long longed to hear. Heaven, earth, moon, sun, and sea, fruits of earth and sea stuff, mouth, ears, Eyes, possession, feet, hands, warriors, tongues, horses, swords, chariots, fair, spears, shields, faces of men, do, mass, chain on leaf, day and night, ebb and flow. The secret rampart of the three whispers is became the whole, and a hero's will is the will of the number and the clans, which is called by three names. Transient in the splendor, a green, tall, grassy keep. It was a stronghold of famous men and sages, free from mortal pain beyond all generations. After coming to a goal eagerly sought, its own right period altar, when she should keep watch, when she might see every bright wonder as a dawn day, not obscure. As her dwelling there, about the eastern level of a noble sanctuary, here it is, my most dearest daughter of Dingo, and listen with your ears and heart. I am here, Abram, God is a prophecy and of dreams. Come here with a message for you all, the chosen seven, and the eighth one to arrive, the one who is not as fair. But can be, with skin like burnt umber and sugary glowing, bright in the moonlight, you are the answer to our prayers. Who will bring us peace everlasting? Who can uncover the secrets of the Holy Trinity, the bell, the book, and the candle, and light the way to awaken the ancients and return once again to the cradle to become reborn again? Heed these words, and know you are loved, our daughters of creation, and the eighth one, who creates infinite light and peace for us all. I am Kair Ebermuth, daughters of prophecy and dreams. I did you adieu, for the love of Ireland in my heart everlasting. The hypnotic heart music that filtered through the trees began to fade, and the voice was gone. The inhabitants of the glen once again opened their eyes and returned to their sacred grove with open eyes and open hearts. Eyes that were misty with tears and wonder, for they had just received the message that they had all been waiting for, and that message was a blessing to the future holy meal made possible by the king, the one who had returned their seventh daughter. And joined their circle as one. And that concludes Christianity Go Get Ready. And the seven daughters of Jingle. And now, and now, Christianity Go Get Ready and the secret of the Holy Trinity. That night, as you celebrate the grand ceremony, all of the altars of Jingle. Now as an honorary eighth daughter, including the three nuns, Henwin and Lorne, and even Lorne's father, Oscar, who was in high spirits, now that his daughter had been returned, safe and sound, all had an enormous and lavish feast, complete with all of Diana's tastiest home-baked goods, delicious corned beef hash, and tossed salads, signature hot cross buns, apple crumble, and her most famous the scrumptious and traditional Irish show the bread. Over their meal, Lorna mentioned she had left a friend named Jubal, who had helped her back on the way off of Dublin, and it was suggested they return him from the great city of Dublin to their friends at home, their hopes of discovering what had happened to her. 
she still had no ideas. Except she, she remembered a shadowy figure in her midst just before she lost all recollection of prior events. Wound up with the inconspicuous bump on the back of her head. He supposed that was an attack, and when asked, with mouthfuls of roast ham and corn beef hashed. I pray not, replied Dorna, but I suppose there were witnesses. Would we find out in Dublin? <laughs> Said with it, he will brought his fist down like a butter. We go to Dublin in the morning. Would you like to come with us, Lorna asked their new companion, pushing him. It would be lovely for you to visit Dublin and see the College of Trinity. It would be lovely, smiled Pushy Emmy, as she took a sip of Irish coffee. Oh, we only plan to stay in Ireland for today. Oh, we wouldn't think of you not visiting Dublin before leaving Ireland, my dear, interjected Diana. It is the most beautiful and significant city, with many treasures and secrets to discover and behold. Pushy Emmy nodded politely in agreement. Though she would have to take it over that night, and perhaps consult her ghouls for gotcha for further guidance. My old dearest friend, get his ghouls, be said, Pushy Emmy. I have come to come to carry just as you have asked, and sought the secret so graciously bestowed here. Why, dear Goolsby, am I to go to Dublin City in the morn? And Goolsby got to reply. In the beginning, the word was good. The word was with God, and the word was God. Pushy Emmy was startled. Goolsby was not on to preach the gospel. My dear Gideon, since when did you preach the Bible? When ghouls be replied, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Pushy Emmy was at a loss. What is the meaning of this? she exclaimed. I am grateful to you, Gideon. But I am exhausted. I must return to my bed. Can you be a bit more specific? To which ghouls be responded even more curiously. I am divine. Here you are the branches. I new commandments I give to you. That you one love another, as I have loved you. Pushy Emmy was moved. Though no more understanding, in spite of her insatiable curiosity, she was spent and needed to rest. So she thanked him as graciously as she could, with a kiss to the ram chip, and lay it back in its place in the nightstand, retired to sleep. The same night, in a dream, Pushy Emmy received a visitation from what looked like a monk in a long white robe, and his long white beard almost glowing in the moonlight. The monk did not introduce himself, only spoken in ancient prayer these very words. Am the door, by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, find pasture, and the way, the truth and the life. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, and all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. The monk was holding a book. Which glowed a greenish hue. The monk nodded in reverence of Pujemi before, in a puff of smoke, he transformed into the most graceful and majestic white tailed eagle and flew away. When Pujemi woke, she knew it was destiny. They were to gather together and head off to Dublin in the morn, home of the legendary tr library, Trinity. They gathered in the morning's plan. And the three nuns were informed of their trip and invited to accompany them to Dublin, which is one of the major cities that the nuns were quite familiar with. And the other three were not. What joy all three nuns accepted the offer and agreed to participate, eager to assist their journey. Luckily, there was a wonderful towering bus, which strangely enough, Hen would have. It was a charming and quirky old bus that still had its charming green hue. From Dublin they drove on to Dundee, the where they stopped for victuals and scalper coins, and paid a visit to County Care Museum so as to visit the collections on offer. The brisk pace of the assembled journey prompted Henry to pronounce and sing song, Green is you, breathing through, and his other famous piece, Can't believe in the burn, cowlets, wah, wah. A limerick, they stopped. From Mexican at Benjamin Beggar's Bush, and there they encountered a gigantic hairy man, who looked like Brian Fussain, a cantankerous man named Vincent, who Pushyami would never forget, and she lovingly dubbed the Bugang of Beggar's Bush. In Galway, they visited the Hall of the Red Earl and Galway City Museum, 
where they were glad to witness an exhibition on myths, legends, and folklore. And then we once again chimed in as they left with the most curious rhyme. <laughs> once with a lady from Dewey Doyle who had a big Christmas for you. She grunted and groaned and looked after her own and loved it she'd sweat and tore you. She went to the talking bun ratty, who said she was luckily fatty. She lanced and was drained with a horrid fright. Though her recovery was sheer delight, and the spider did not put up a fight. As soon as they were settled in Dublin, they grabbed a quick bite and were off to visit the famous library. Push Emmy there was spoken about her father and was always fantasized as a child about the mysterious book of chaos, which was housed there and the ancient horror that the library coveted, as well as other famous, incredibly old, and yet somehow intact manuscripts, which were kept safely there. These were thankfully not many people in the grand old library that day. The old old hall, with its many busts of Irish writers, come and gone, and leaving their legacies felt like a church, and pushed them in another two, but the need to remain completely silent, out of respect. The others were just as quiet as well, Pausing to marvel at the ancient texts brought before the middle of the long hall with one on spay, or not on the shoes. The large vaulted ceiling beckoned to push Emmy to gaze up at the stacks of the upper floor, wondering how many books were kept up there. The nun stopped to have a chat with an old friend of theirs, Olivia Kersley, who was one of the curators of the museum, as well as a student there. That was when push Emmy saw it from out of the corner of her eye, a book at the far end of the stacks nearest to her. Short brown book seemed to glow, strange green as you. She was about to reach out towards it when Sister Blythe appeared at her side and touched her shoulder, so it's not to startle her. Push, push, Sammy, dear. I'd like you to feel a friend of ours. Miss Olivia Kersley carried her books here at Trinity Library. Sister Blythe pulled Olivia over and pushed Sammy smiled as they shook hands. Miss Olivia is a student here as well. In fourth year, Miss Olivia, push him. Is a student of ancient artifacts and knowledge. I'm sure you two will get along swimming. Well, Shammy smiled and nodded in agreement. Pleased to meet another academic. But she couldn't help but glance over her shoulder at the stacks. The book had dimmed somewhere, but still sparkled slightly. And Push Shammy knew she'd have to find a way to get that book. Olivia invited Push Shammy and the other for tea and coffee at the Perth Cafe on campus. Afterwards, they explored the campus, visiting the campus museum. And afterwards, they joined the nuns for a short visit to the campus chapel. All the while, Push Shammy couldn't stop thinking about the book and the stacks. Why had it glowed? Why was it distracting her all evening? And sure enough, Henry noticed. Excuse me, Pussy whispered at her when they had a rare moment side by side, staring at an exposition. What are you all right? There was a book. Push Shammy wasn't sure how to proceed. Never mind. I'm fine, thank you. You look like you're the green round of gills, remarked Gill. Or remarked Henry. When fine things, push him scowled. Just tired. By the way, where are we planning to catch our dinner? They ate a good meal at the campus restaurant, Trinity 1592, which was in the front square. Afterwards, Henry took Lauren to the hospital. She stayed out to speak of the doctors and find some answers. While they were gone, Olivia showed push him around the library. She had owed the nuns a favour, and the nuns encouraged Olivia to take after them, and to take push Emmy to the library after regular library hours, which was a special privilege only certain academics were privy to. The nuns chose to explore the many ancient books that were behind glass, as Olivia was allowed to momentarily take them out of the cases. So this is the Book of Kells, that breathtakingly beautiful ancient version of the New Testament penned by Columban monks who left for Ireland after Vikings drove them out of Scotland. Meanwhile, Push Emmy went in search of the glowing book, but she knew only she was meant to find it. Once again, to her amazement, there was the book with the greenest glowing hue. It made her wonder, perhaps if a leprechaun might be hiding behind it. Very carefully, so as not to disturb the other hooks, she donned both hands with proper gloves and carefully, also carefully, removed the book from its place. It was hard to say how old the book was, but it had definitely been in, around and housed in the library for some time. The name of it was in Latin, but most curious of all was a peculiar geometric symbol on the spine of the book, a type of sacred geometry she had never seen before. 
As Pushyami inspected further, she noticed on the spine of the book that there was a secret compartment, and that this secret compartment there was a tiny copper key. Curiously, she sensed the need to turn around, right opposite her, on the other bookshelf, in the empty cubby hole where the books used to be. There was a secret key hole, which glowed that same greenish hue. Key now itself did. Pushyami knew what to do. She quickly replaced the book, pocketed the key. She was about to put the key into the keyhole when Olivia returned, completely flustered. Miss, it seems as if Sister Cordelia has gotten ill, she proclaimed, and we must take her to hospital. Will you stay here with Sister Primrose while Sister Blythe and I attend to her? Of course, Pushy Amy brightened. This could be her chance. She glanced with concern towards the three nuns, as Sister Cordelia did in fact not look well. What's wrong, sister? asked Pushemi, taking the nun's hands in hers. Oh, sighed Sister Cordelia. Tease me heart, me dear. Flutters a bit from time to time. She seemed out of breath, and the other two nuns were holding her by the arm to keep her steady. Oh, be all right, she reassured Pushemi, as well as the others, who looked equally concerned. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Have faith in good, and faith in me. Pushemi bent to kiss the nun's hands. Bless you, sister, she whispered. Be will. After they left, Blythe returned to examine the Book of Kills, trusting Pushyami to be fine on her own in this great library. She returned once to the same bookshelf, and as soon as she took the glowing key, she found the glowing keyhole. Almost immediately, a panel slid away from the bookshelf, revealing a secret call space. Inside, she found what she appeared to be a secret study, of whose it was not clear. But inside this crawl space were several cubbies. In one, there lay a binding of pages, pages that, upon first inspection, made Pushyami's heart leap with joy. For these were precious pages filled with ancient wisdom, as ornate as the Book of Kells itself, and filled with messages from an ancient race, the Tuatha Dei De Nun, the very same race of immortals that the goddess Gare, who had delivered the prophetic message of peace, belonged to. The folios in the book were each like paintings, intricately decorated with the most delicate of tools that could even make a grown man weep. Inside the manuscript there was a bookmark, a bookmark that had almost slightly visible, faint green hue, contained two sheets of vellum. Between each was placed the image of a three-leaf clover, which seemed to glow, the brightest and proudest of all. Poor Shiemi couldn't believe what she'd come upon. She quickly pocketed the bookmark, knowing she wasn't really stealing. It was destiny. She had been led to this very spot, perhaps by the monk in her dreams. For a moment, Pushy Amy carefully studied the manuscript. At the very back of the last page, she found what could turn out to be a completely full-coloured map. The map detailed very specific places throughout the world, and curiously enough, Bingo was one of them. There was not only places located throughout Ireland, but also the UK as well. The strangest part was that these names were written in Latin, and Paul Shimmy had no idea what they represented, and it seemed as though they were significant places in both cities and countryside. There were notes on the back of the map, but once again they were in Latin, and with sketches some what appeared to be, and this pushed Yami's heart took a leap, standing still. There were several cities which names would been circled, and somehow Paul Shimmy was not surprised to see that they were familiar. They began with Dingle, led to Dublin, and from Dublin to Belfast, and Belfast to the Isle of Man. What could it all possibly mean? She pocketed the map, planning later to consult her Gilsby Gutcher. Oh my goodness, Sister Blythe appeared by her side, and in a moment pushed every froze with a cry, fearing she might be reprimanded. What did you do with that manuscript? I was out to seek it, replied Pushy. There was a key, a door. Crawl space. No, I'm disappointed in thee. Sister Bly's voice was hushed with the utmost of awe, as if in the presence of royalty. But I am not in the least. My dear, you have completed the second quest. It is all in the prophecy is dictated by the goddess, just as we knew it would be so. Sister threw her arms around the eighth daughter of Dingle. He has returned yet another discovery. We must alert the queen. When Olivia returned, unexpectedly, with Henry, and nowhere there in tow, there was a big hullabaloo as a crowd had assembled to celebrate the discovery. 
A crowd of reporters then arrived complete with cameras, all ready to take the picture of Ireland's new greatest hero, Bushami Gogoreddy, she who held the Mrs. Book of the Book of Kellis, who would now be held for the library. Bushami insisted they could not have done it without her two friends, Enwin and Lorna, and so it was Enwin who finally got his wish. He was acknowledged as one of the last remaining royal birds of Ireland, and Lorna felt safer knowing she was commemorated in the public eye and would always be remembered, regardless of how she lost her memory. There it was, a feast of great festivities, and there were many great joys, during which the company of Pushy and Gilgarelli honoured and celebrated a great discovery that might rewrite the entire history of Ireland and then return the secrets of the ancients to the Emerald Isle. Once again, and that concludes Bushami Gogoretti and the Secrets of the Holy Trinity. And now we have Bushami Gogoretti and the bell ringing Bard of Belfast. Look, the celebrations begin. Bushami was given an honourable banquet bestowed upon herself, and when in Lorna, the three nuns to celebrate her most prestigious discovery. And there were many great joys. That feast was held in Trinity College's 18th century child dining hall, and provided all the goodies they could think of to whet their appetite. Round the door, the three nuns beat with pride at the precious Pushyami, and then when in Lorna celebrated the event with a kiss. After the two and the festivities were done, the trio was granted a special private touring of the St. Columba Church, which was not far away in the county town of Swords. The church was the remains of a monastery built by St. Columba, a Columban abbot turned saint, whose monks were responsible for creating the Book of Kells. After touring the church, the tower and the cemetery, Pushyam and her friends were permitted to douse themselves with the holy water, which was not open to the public. Pushyami felt a shiver rush over her, as she was graced by the ancient gods and goddesses who were celebrating this very event. Embracing Pushyami in spite of her Indian heritage as an honorary daughter of Ireland. My, this place is a tad spooky, isn't it? And when cozied up to Lorna as they strode through the cemetery back to the bus, which Henwin had lovingly nicknamed the Greenish Hue. It's my dad's name, don't you know? He said, by way of explanation. It's been around for hundreds of years, Pushami whispered back, so surely you can't be surprised it will have a present. Tears clearly haunted Miss Pay, but Henwin whispered, I believe I saw a spirit back in. Hush now, exclaimed Pushami, we are in the presence of guests. She smiled at her guide, a young woman named Osho, and a young man named Mark. They smiled politely back. But, but Miss P! And when clung to her like a frightened child. <laughs> and when Pushyami hissed, peace too. She glanced around, suddenly alarmed. There's Lorna. As if one clue, Lorna appeared. We're being followed, Lorna whispered. I saw two men peeking out from the windows of the round tower. Let's be going then, Henwin Shiver. This place gives me the creeps. They bid their kindly guides adieu and made haste to the green issue. Then they took the N1 to the hill Tara as they drove a dove flew in front of the bus, though leading the way, and pushed him his sword as a good omen, bestowed perhaps by the very St. Columba himself. It was round noon that they arrived at the sacred hill of Tara, a great ancient site, and it was an everlasting honour of ancient kings, where so many kings of old Ireland were inaugurated upon its sacred soil. There they were, and they were greeted by many maids round, raised mounds and ditches, as well as Celtic crosses stood in an enclosure of the ancient green hillside. The rolling green land stretched out before them, and with the historic spiritual sites new grains to the east, and hill of slain to the west. The hill of Tara is a hill, an ancient ceremonial burial site, near Screen, County Mate, Ireland, timed in Goosby, as they enjoy the view. Tradition identifies the hill as the inauguration frame and seat of the High Kings of Ireland. It also appears in Irish mythology. Tara consists of more, numerous monuments and earthworks dating from the Neolithic to the Iron Age including a passage to the Mound of the Hostages, burial mounds, round enclosures, a standing stone believed to be the Stone of Destiny, and a ceremonial avenue. There's also a church and graveyard on the hill. Tara forms a large ancient landscape. Tara itself is a protected national monument. 
under the care of the Office of Public Works and an agency for Irish government. You will be right back, so push me. I'm off to visit his own destiny. The saying it gave her the shoes. And we stopped and gave her a curious stare. Sure, you don't want us to come with? No, thank you. Push Yemi smiled at him and concerned Lorna politely. I shall return. That message continued every step she took when she arrived at the circle. She heard. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. And then, a message that seemed to be carried upon the wind. We entreat you, holy youth, come and walk still among us. It was hard when she reached the center of the circle, where the majestic standing stone remained, could not feel as if though she were surrounded by the most holy, the holiest and ancient royal kings, all bowing their heads in reverence to respect her royal. She bowed her head and closed her eyes. Almost immediately, she saw in her mind's eye the scenes unfolding of many a king becoming initiated into power, and from these images, a great old tree with branches donned with beautiful ribbons. Kushiami opened her eyes and thanked the stone of destiny as she went off in search of the tree. She found it over the hillside, an enormous, great old tree with ribbons of practically every color. As she neared the tree, it would be spoke. This is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks, bearded with moss, and in garments of green, distinct in the twilight, stand like druids of old, with voices as sad and prophetic, stand like harpers of old, with beards that rest on their bosoms, loud from the rocky caverns, the deep voiced neighboring ocean speaks, and in accents disconsolate answers the wail of the forest. Words worth long fellow. And then Oh, which tree is an individual tree, usually distinguished by species, position, or appearance, which is used as an option for wishes and offerings. Such trees are identified as possessing a special religious or spiritual value. Postulants make votive offerings in hopes of having a wish granted, prayer answer, from a nature spirit, saint, or goddess, depending on the local tradition. Wishing tree, push Emmy paused. Suddenly she could hear the sounds of faint laughter. Like that play for children. Yet there were no children around. The whole thorn is known in Ireland, the fairy tree, who will be continued faithfully. It is often referred to as the gentle bush, a lone bush or thorn, as it is disrespectful to mention the names of the fairies. Ah, so this was a fairy tree, a sacred tree for wishing upon. Suddenly she heard a small drop to the ground. At first she thought it was a relic might have fallen from the branches. When she stooped to pick it up, she noticed it was a curious looking stone, a simple grey, which had some lichen growing upon it, which meant it was very old indeed. Pushyami surmised that no one would miss the stone, so she pocketed it quickly. She thanked the fairies for her gift, and setting down upon the nice cool grass to meditate, was soon upon her way. The nuns had friends in Belfast which were also Roman Catholic nuns, and these nuns had been requesting their presence for some time now. And since Pushyami mean, had always wanted to see that grand city, and since the lovely city of Dublin had given them a grant award, they decided to go exploring. And we drove straight to Belfast without stopping, and they arrived in less than two hours. After grazing and grabbing a quick bite to eat, they gathered together at St. Patrick's Cathedral, one of the grandest churches in Belfast. The silence inside of Craig Patrick's church was warm and inviting, and they admired the grand stained glass windows and the rest of the lavishly involved decor throughout the sacred space. Pushami often marveled at the large ceilings of many of the churches she'd seen, and this one was no different, even grander perhaps than the rest. She wondered whether the purpose for the height of such churches was just about making you feel small. Or whether there was some other reason behind it. Pushyami considered perhaps the reason that it was enlivening the mind and bringing them closer to good. It was then that she began to smell the most curious of smells, which stopped her completely in place. Imagine it so small, how a smell, how a smell strong must be to call attention to itself in the presence of this grand cathedral ceiling. The smell was tantalizing. A combination of curry and fish and chips with mushy peas.
but there's also a hint of something she couldn't identify. It was definitely those Monster Munch pickled onion chips all into the mix in a confusing juxtaposition with the mysterious scent of Zangiro and the brisk aroma of Tetsuki. In this combination, Push Yami smelled something delicious, and she followed her nose straight to the kitchen, kitchen of future smells. As Push Yami got closer to the source of the smells, her curiosity grew. How could it be that such a diversity could be congregated in one church kitchen? She wondered where the cook was that had created such a diverse collection of goods, mixed in just the right fashion so as to transport you to another world. She entered into the, what she assumed to be the kitchen, and found it to be so. Strangely enough, upon this counter and a dining room table, there was no food whatsoever. However, that was about to rapidly change, for no sooner that she had arrived than did a delivery. At least takeaway curry, complete with chicken korma, butter chicken appeared, fresh and steamy. No, it had been cooked right in that very kitchen. But she, I mean, was thrilled by the sight. She sat right down, happy to have something she was so familiar with, if only peripherally in this form. It had been a while since she had this classic Indian meal. She had forgotten how good it was. The spices were a nice change of pace, and she could hardly argue with the wonderful Irish cream and butter used. The rice seemed insane, as if every grain picked to serve a salt in. She had herself a nice little bowl of a little bit of each, over to them a steaming rice, when Henwin arrived, carrying a bag from the local fish and ships. He was led there, by the aromas emanating, curiously ruminating over the fact that he was bringing fish and chips into a place, the squirrel, the smell was quite loud of it. The nuns came in complaining, they were complaining each of them, that when the meal was spoiled, because the smell of the meal preceded them. As they entered the kitchen, it dawned on them that all the food they smelled had gathered here before them. Confusedly, they greeted Push Yami and Hen, wondering aloud that these place might be haunted. Or how was this possible? And yet, instead of considering this to work with the devil, they went about getting all their meals on the table. After everything was out, they took a phrase of all the component compliments at each other, and shared alike. Finally, the generous did seek he portion complimentary to the curries. You pour the curry sauce over the gyros. Oh, God, they explained, as they poured the sauces all over everything. As they stuffed their gums, they heard a singing. The most curious singing any of them had ever heard before. And then when paused, with his mouth full of food to listen. I can't believe never heard and Camelot dot com Camelot dot com and when looked about for the source of the voice but found none what in the world is accounted as if in reply he heard again I can't believe in the bed of Camelot and suddenly as if on cue a young fair haired man in a dark brown robe and simple shoes appeared before them and blinked where he had come from are you a bard? questioned Henwin. I am a bard named Augustus, replied the strange looking spectre in a strange sing songy voice. Augustus a bard was I. I was a guard named Augustus. Augustus a guard was I. I'm sorry, replied Push Yemi. Did you say was I? I was a guard named Augustus, became the same reply. Augustus a bard was I. Sister Blythe did the sign of the cross over Augustus, and then she stood back. Are you the one that made all this fine food for us? Tis I, replied Augustus, with a sort of nod, however smiling. And you are in great company, because I am the guardian of the kitchen of future smells. They had all gathered around while Augustus told his story. He had been guarding the belfry when he felt as if he had been pushed, and off he fell. That was the last he remembered before he walked in the kitchen, and had been down there ever since. This was a long time ago, and when wife like himself were taken in by the nuns, broke to work in the belfries. He lived at the cathedral, and as he did now, there was a guardian in the kitchen, where he created the most fantastical food you could ever imagine, none of which he could eat, but all of which the living could soon sing. And as they listened to the ancient bard, it felt as if time had stopped. And the rest of the world had slipped away, and only their world remained. Henwin, who usually feared spirits of all kinds, found in himself an unexpected kinship, the kind of brotherhood that only two bards knew. The rest of the group watched as the two bards joined their voices as one of them danced and sang 
putting on a free show for all ages, but for all those that were present. Him and I are going to have a real bunch. And him and I like, what to do about the butternut squash? What to do about the tunnel? What to do about the butternut squash? We don't, we don't, we don't see that. And also, come count it, but there's others coming. They're ever increasing in inordinate amounts of downtime. Somehow, throughout all of this, Cushy Hemming got it into her brain to ask her questions, show them the belfry. She wasn't sure why, but she knew they absolutely had to see it, and that there would be bestowed upon them a grand blessing there. As they climbed the belfry, Augustus explained, there was a secret hidden where the sun didn't shine. Ascending the final parapet, the assembled were told to shine the flashlight up into the upper interior of the bell, attached to the belfry so from the ceiling. It seemed embossed on the outside, but curiously engraved on the inside. A triskelion of legs. There were also the focal point of the engraving were two words. Mayor Juan Essos. Wealth for dead already. Is the symbol of the Iron Man, Edwin explained. Yes, replied Augustus. Many a board have come there, and many a board will go. And then so shall we all, agreed Pushemi. And so they all lift on a ferry in a morn to the Isle of Man. And that concludes Bellarmine Bard of Belfast and Pushyami's original Irish trilogy, which this is complete. And we hope you'll join us for the next trilogy. We start with Pushyami Gilgarelli and the Isle of Man. It's another trilogy coming after that. It's a trilogy of trilogies. It's the Pushyami Gilgarelli neurology. Working on it with my wife. She spearheaded this. And I came up with all the characters and the premises and everything. But we worked on it together. It was grand to share this wonderful story with our audience. If you like this content, tune in for more. Tune in to the prequel, Arthur Osborne's True Tales of the Supernatural, wherein Push Yammy is introduced. we got more coming. Spin-offs. And every character that you can imagine and more is going to be explored on this channel. We hope to celebrate more cultural heritage with you and join in for more. And if you like this content, tell your friends, like, and subscribe. And that's going to be it for us today. What a grand journey. Thank you for sharing it.